Our Open Book, Open Minds series is funded through the generosity of the Montclair Public Library Foundation through its donors, and including grants from the Montclair Foundation and Investors Foundation. Well, thank you all for coming out on a cold, wet night. Uh, but this is exciting. I'm incredibly happy to have uh, Rachel here with us. Uh, this is this is a phenomenal piece of work, and it's it's very different, obviously, than many of the open book, open minds, because this is a coffee table book. It's a conversation piece. It's not kind of the traditional novel uh, that we would showcase. And so I was very excited to have this here uh, tonight because I think it really captures, you know, what has happened over the course of time when history is either redacted or it's not shared or it's lost or it's missing. I think Rachel and, and Darcy have done a very good job of capturing a lot of the moments in history uh, that were never seen in the New York Times. And it's really exciting when you hear the story of how this work came to be, and I'm looking forward to hearing them talk about the morgue at the New York Times, which is where all of the photos are kept in archive. And so for us, I think, you know, what's also special and unique about tonight is that all three of these folks live either in Montclair, two of them do, and one, Marcy, lives in um, Glen Ridge. So to have these treasures uh, in our community is very powerful, and to have both of them be a part of Open Book, Open Minds is exciting, and, and definitely we'll have you back, Rachel, understand you're working on a new book uh, focused on the uh, connection of slavery to Georgetown University, which is a very powerful story. I think it's coming out in 2020, so we're going to book you ahead. Uh, first on your stop as you as you launch that tour. Uh, just very quickly, just a little bit of background on Rachel and, and Darcy and Mark. Um, many of you might remember or recall or have heard of Rachel's name, not only from the Times and having a career there that spans back to the mid-90s on a variety of different roles as a domestic correspondent, but also having worked uh, in foreign capacity as well, spent time in Cuba, Russia, as well as South Africa. She's covered the LA riots, but you might remember her as having been the author of American Tapestry, which was a very interesting book written about our former First Lady Michelle Obama that traced her gene genealogy and looked at uh, kind of her family history. There's so much talk about President Obama having mixed lineage. Uh, and so she took it upon herself to establish the work and look at uh, Michelle Obama, Obama's geological history and DNA and found that she in fact had white ancestors in her background. So if you haven't read American Tapestry, check it out. I watch on booksellers uh, and uh, you know, you can learn a little bit more about our first lady. Um, so, so Rachel's story is a powerful one, having spent a number of years at, at the New York Times, and again, a variety of roles, but also as an author, and so we're just pleased to have her here. Darcy uh, is a photo editor at the New York Times, again, lives locally, and so we're just happy that she could be here as well to share in this story and the storytelling of how this came to be. And last but not least, Mark, uh, seated in the center here, is the national editor of the New York Times and will be leading us through the conversation. Mark's work, at least I became most recently familiar with your work because he's really kind of expanded the conversation in the New York Times uh, in recent months and years around race and race-related issues. So I've enjoyed reading and, and seeing some of the digital content on race as well as reading the articles in the paper. And thank you, Mark, for being a trailblazer in that regard. So with that, I'll turn it over to, to Mark as he takes us through and, and interviews our two featured guests tonight. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. I was here one other time as moderator, but I think it was a, a crisp fall uh, evening. <laughs> and, uh, there were a lot of people, but it, it does not compare to this because you are hardcore. Everybody <laughs> really wanted to be here, and we appreciate it. We really do. Um, everyone sort of really, um, this is impressive. <laughs> so I am the national editor of the Times, and one of the best parts of my job is I get to work with amazing 
people like the two people here, and they're not um, run-of-the-mill um, journalists in any way. And one of the odd things about them, um, yeah, they're, it's odd. So, so you think of journalism, and you think of um, we're covering the present day. You know, we're covering what um, the president tweeted, or we're covering a protest, or or some events that's going on. But both of these two often look back in the work that they do as journalists. Um, and so we're going to start with Darcy, who often was not around in the newsroom where the bustle was going on. She was in this place called the morgue, and it has this ominous name. And uh, I've been there. It's downstairs in a basement. And so tell us, um, there are some young people here. <coughs> Um, uh, well, one of them is here. Don't. <laughs> there, uh, there are people here who may never have been in a newspaper morgue. What is it? Tell us. The morgue is this magnificent collection of photographs of the New York Times. It dates back uh, for about 100 years. Uh, the bulk of the collection uh, ranges from um, maybe the late 1940s and moving forward. And it contains about 10 million print photographs. Of those 10 million print photographs, we expect that we have about 3.5 million of those images are staff photographs. But beyond the morgue, we have what we call the negatives collection. Um, and that's where a big bulk of this project came from. So if we have, say, 3.5 million staff prints, the photographers maybe shot one roll of film to go along with that print, or sometimes they shot 50 rolls of film or 100 rolls of film. And all told, the negatives collection, along with the current digital collection, uh, we expect that the Times has somewhere between 400 and 600 million photographs in its mm -hmm. archives. It is enormous. <laughs> Incredible. So, so uh, Rachel over here, um, we had a t we have a team of people. Um, who are covering race in America. Um, and it's called Race Related. There's a newsletter you can sign up for, and you all should. Uh, but Rachel did something rather <coughs> strange. Um, there's a lot of things going on with race in America right now, if you haven't noticed. Rachel <laughs> sort of um, started um, looking backwards, though, in a lot of her stories. And she was looking back not a week or two, but you know, generations back. Tell us about one of the, what, an example of that and how you sort of became a journalist that was looking at history. Um, it really started for me uh, looking at um, Michelle Obama and um, when I was covering her during her first year in the White House. And, um, you know, as, as John said, there was a lot of interest in the president and his background. And we decided, well, you know, maybe there's something to be done about Mrs. Obama and her background. Um, and a story that I did about her great, great, great grandmother, uh, who was an enslaved girl, valued at about four hundred fifty dollars, and her great, great, great grandfather, who was a white man whose identity was a mystery, um, was a story that led to my book and to this passion for the nineteenth century, um, which continues with me today. Um, but because of, you know, so I, I'm just really kind of, the, the 1800s are where I like to live, but um, Mark came to me um, and said, you know, Darcy Evely has this, like, amazing project. You could write just a couple of essays. I'm like, I'm really busy. I'm really, really busy. <laughs> just a few essays. Just see what she's done. And when I saw what she had done, I was, like, completely sucked in. <laughs> what uh, Rachel left out is the look that she gave me when I came to her with this. So, so this project started with, with Darcy. With Darcy um, yeah, Darcy was in an office showing photos that she had uncovered to another editor. They called me in, and I looked at it, and Darcy was talking, was was crazed. <laughs> <laughs> she, was, she was into it, and I was, wow. I said, so I said, I know just the person to work with you to make this project 
captain, and that was my only role. I went over to Rachel and said, Rachel, this is something you should do. She gave me a very, very suspicious look. Um, and then I sort of got out of the way, and this book was born. And it ran, first of all, on, on the New York Times site. It ran in print, and then it became a book. And you're going to see some of it soon. Um, and it's really extraordinary. I mean, one of the things that um, this project gets at a little bit, and I wanted to talk to both of you, because I think it's an important thing, is diversity at the New York Times. So I think, I think that's something that is an undercurrent in the project. So, so tell us a little bit about um, photo diversity among photographers, photo editors at the New York Times. Um, well, the staff now is pretty diverse, but back at the start of, of the time, um, it, that wasn't the case, actually. And we actually didn't hire our first African-American photographer until the late 1960s. It was after the New York riots. Um, and they realized that having somebody uh, on staff who uh, would have better access into communities of color was going to make the coverage report better. And so uh, we see some of that in the book. We realize that there may have been um, some examples of bias in the editing um, because the staff was mainly white male at the time in the 1960s. Uh, it, it, I think they hired their first woman shortly after their first African-American photographer. I believe she was early 1970s. And so the, the staff and the coverage and the look of the photography has changed very much so over the years. Mm -hmm. and, and tell us why, uh, Rachel, you think um, that that was such an important element you know, lack of diversity in a newsroom and sort of how that then affects what readers, subscribers uh, see and, and, you know, in the product. You know, one of the things that we were really interested um, in, and really Darcy will tell you more about kind of the genesis of this and how she came up with this amazing um, concept, but, you know, we're looking at photos that were unpublished, photos that did not appear in the newspaper before. And so the question is, you know, of course, about why they, they hadn't been published um, and about the decision making. And um, I think that is, you know, we'll talk about that more specifically with, with, with books and the images that you'll see, but it's something that, you know, newspapers, media companies um, wrestle with today. And, um, you know, part of the coverage, this, this emerged out of an effort to make sure that we were covering these issues in a viral um, and creative way. Another thing you'll see in this project that really impresses me is how um, these journalists interacted with uh, readers. So the old way that the New York Times viewed itself is we sort of pronounced what was going on and then subscribers or readers would read the voice of the New York Times and we had some sense that you were out there, you could write letters to us or call us, um, but that was the old, only interaction. Nowadays, um, we are trying to engage with readers much more. Um, and what really impressed me was when you were reaching out to readers, and maybe, will we see an example? Okay. Tell, tell us a little bit about what that concept was. <laughs> uh, it came, it sort of came by accident, didn't it, Rachel? Right. It was just sort of, because we were sitting around, if you can imagine, it was a really kind of very collaborative process, and she, you've got all these photos, she's showing us photos, we're like, but, but what about this person, what about that person, and we're like looking, and then kind of brainstorming how this is going to emerge in real time. I think at one point a reader um, wrote to us, we were receiving many, many emails, and a reader wrote in and asked a question about a picture, and it never occurred to us we'll to actually explore the, the reader's question until we got it. So, And then it became a whole different project. We wanted to hear from readers on every picture. And we had thought about reaching out on some pictures. You know, We, we had questions that we wanted um, readers to engage with, but, um, but people come to you with surprising questions. Um, and, and that was part of the fun of it. We had such an enormous response. For each of you, what's the most, what's been the 
the best uh, reaction that you've gotten to this uh, project or um, something that sticks in I'm your I'm going to save that for the very last thing I say. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to share that with you. <laughs> Rachel, what's something that's really what touched you? What's really great was that um, people saw themselves in these pictures. You know, like, so there are a bunch of things, you know, like parades in New York, and we had people writing in, oh, I remember that. You know, I was there that day. Um, and also at the end, this was something that kind of came to us as we were going to, uh, we decided to ask people to share their own, you know, their own unpublished um, images. And that was really powerful too. Yeah, yeah. So this is an amazing project. I think we should see some of the photos. So let's start with, um, with some. So the project actually uh, began when our co-author Dana Kennedy asked us, uh, came to me and asked me if there was something that I could do from the archive that would be of interest to young African American readers to, for Black History Month. And um, the thought occurred to me that a few years beforehand I had had a conversation with John Godfrey Morris who during the 1960s and early 1970s, John was the picture desk editor. I met him when he turned 95 years old. And I asked him, I, I, I said to him, John, is there anything that, as a photo editor working in the archives, is there anything I should go back and re-edit? And, and John said to me, Darcy, go back and re-edit everything. And he told this story about how um, Back in the old days, the Times would often, the photo editors would often have to edit photographs for the amount of space available in the print newspaper. So words would run long. Uh, oftentimes they would have one column, maybe a two or three inch picture, to uh, illustrate a story. And so when Dana asked this, the, the, the thought of the conversation with John occurred to me. And I, I figured, Let, let's go back and take a look and see if maybe this will work. Let's go back and re edit the black history. So I started with Dr. King, the most iconic photograph that I know of of Dr. King from the New York Times. And when you look at the second frame up here, you'll see on the back of the print, um, this, is a, this is what the back of the print is like. Now in the archives, we have three of these. And as it turns out, um, they all look like this. We've published this particular image many, many, many times. And in that mess at the top up there, you see some sort of type. And what we have in there, what we call a sack number. So, so let me go back, take a look at this sack, and see what else. Dr. King in that portrait, a very formal portrait, looks very serious. Maybe he's laughing, maybe the eyes are closed, maybe there's something different in, in another frame. Well, it turns out, when I went back to the film, that it wasn't in portrait after all. It was Dr. King at a round table event uh, at a local news station. Yeah, we go. And it turns out that the photographer photographed this event, but in the middle of it stopped, stepped forward, and captured that iconic portrait of Dr. King. Well, I looked at the paper the next day, and it happened to be a page one story. Um, and what I noticed was there was no photograph with it. Yeah, let's just stick on this one for a minute. Um, that's okay. So there was no story. There was no photograph of the story. But the page one story talked about how Dr. King, after he left this round table event, was attacked and egged by protest force. So the photographer never captured that. He captured this portrait. He captured this round table event. And you could just imagine the next after that afternoon in the newsroom, the kerfuffle when everyone was screaming, did you get the picture? Did you get the picture? And the photographer goes, yeah, I got this great portrait. <laughs> well, that wasn't the story for the next day. So no photograph ran with it. And so when we figured, when, once we found this, and we found a few other iconic images, we realized that we think that this is actually going to work. Let's go back, look at many famous photographs from the Times, and let's see what would happen. <coughs> So the next one that we're looking at here, um, we open up the book with this story. And this was uh, 1971, 72. Uh, and this was the old New York Times building uh, in, uh, on 43rd Street. And this was an, an African-American organization who came out in front of the Times to protest. They were furious with the Times, not only the, cover of the coverage of their organization, but they were mad at the company's coverage of African-Americans in general. So the protests went on, flipped through, and it started to get ugly. Um, they began to riot. Um, next thing you know, oh, go back one. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
There should be one more friend in there. No? No. Okay, so go back. Um, yeah, there it is. Um, they lit our trucks on fire. Um, and uh, the next day in the paper, there was a nice long story, uh, a couple of columns, uh, but no photographs. Yet every single time this photographer stepped out of the building and took pictures. And so we have to ask ourselves, why did they plan so much coverage for the story, but no coverage for the photographs? Oops. Can we go back to the Yeah. So this is one of my favorites. Um, we we had learned with someone who, uh, you know, I, I wanted uh, Darcy to see if we had um, any photos of her. Um, of course, she had appeared in the paper before, and she uh, this was uh, this photo was taken um, around the time that she had a television show airing, and it was um, an interview of her, a kind of feature story about her new show, um, and um, just about her. And we ran this tiny, tiny little uh, photograph, a headshot, um, with, um, with the story and not this lovely photo. What was really interesting, too, about this project uh, as a writer was that um, normally photos come with the story or you know, with your reporting. So you go out as a journalist, you interview people, and you call a photo editor and say, OK, I need someone to take you know, this picture. This was a completely different because the photograph was the point of departure. So we have these amazing images, and there's Lena, and I've got to write something about her and, and, and that image. And, and because I'm a New Yorker, I look at it and think, what a great apartment she's in. <laughs> <laughs> and so in the story um, about her new TV show, there was a kind of throwaway line, you know, she's decorated for the holidays and she mentions uh, you know I'm so glad to be here because it was so hard to find an apartment and I'm like it was hard for Lena Horne to find an apartment um, of course Lena Horne was an African-American woman I mean a celebrity a sensation but in the 1950s and 1960s, early 1960s she could not get an apartment in New York City and the story is a fabulous one because it starts with Harry, Harry Belafonte also, like a record breaker in you know music sales, uh, actor, you know incredible, um, who could also not find an apartment in New York City, um, and so he sent his white publicist to this building, um, who signed the papers and pretended like he was moving in, and then Harry and his wife show up, and the building manager is furious, which makes Harry furious, and so he bought the building. <laughs> And he brought his friends um, uh, to move in too, and, and she got the penthouse. <laughs> so the next is a series of photos. Uh, I mentioned earlier, Mark asked about diversity. These photos were taken by uh, Don Hogan Charles, who was the first African American photographer put on staff. And what's sort of interesting about this collection of pictures is that Don. When was charged with going out and photographing his Harlem neighborhood. And uh, he shot on a Saturday and a Sunday. And Monday morning, uh, I looked at the paper, the Monday, the Monday paper, and there were six photographs at the top of the metro section, which must have been an enormous photo essay at the time. The Times was the gray lady. They did not run big collections of photographs, often, especially not in news sections. And there were six beautiful pictures that, that were included in this story about life in Harlem. So I pulled the photos, and when I opened up what we call the sack of negatives, it turns out that there were something like 100 rolls of film. Now, figure 100 rolls, 36 on a frame, we're talking 3,600 pictures. The Times ran six. The rest of them got stuffed back into the envelope and stored away for 50 plus years. And what's so fascinating is picture after picture after picture, one was more beautiful than the next. We really felt it was a good opportunity to bring these pictures back out. And um, somebody once said to us, actually, at a, at a talk, they said, well, you do a whole book on this day. I said, I could do three books on this day. <laughs> but it just kind of gives you sort of a sense of what the enormity of this collection is. And um, you know, they never had a reason to go back to that film again. The Times would shoot something for the day. And then it would get stored away. If they had to go cover Harlem again, they'd go back out and cover Harlem again. Why go back to the old pictures? This is the way news photos work. They're old a few days later, or a few weeks later. So if we could just flip through 
through these quickly. Um, and what was so fascinating, I think Don lived here in this neighborhood, and you can sort of see that he, he becomes this fly on the wall here. You know, people don't notice that he's here. And you have to wonder, in the 60s, had they sent a white photographer up there, or, or somebody not from the community, uh, he might not have had the access. He might not have gotten this close to a Domino's game. I think Don shot the, the church one from his building rooftop, actually. There's one in there. And this one. That's it. Okay, we can stop there. Um, so Arthur Ashe is up next. So when we talked about, um, we can get that now to Arthur Ashe. When we talked about um, questions that we had as we were looking at this collection, um, this was one of those quest places where we asked ourselves, was there an issue of racial bias? <coughs> Um, this is Arthur Ashe, and um, it was a big upset. He um, defeated, um, uh, you know, a much higher ranked um, player um, and moved to the semifinals. And uh, we ran some very nice dramatic photos of the loser, hmm. but not a single one of the winner. Oh, wow. Now there are lots of reasons why um, some photos weren't published. As Darcy mentioned, we were the great lady, so really we didn't put a premium on photos. Um, and you know, sometimes film might have arrived late, um, and we don't know that. Um, even so, but what's you know. fascinating about this, though, um, these photos were all taken by the same photographer, and they were in the same sack. And they were all together. So it wasn't an issue of it didn't arrive. And then we looked at the shape. They're both vertical pictures. Um, you can go back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there was no reason that we can figure why they ran two pictures of the white loser. Now, yeah, that's a pretty dramatic shot of him rolling on the ground. I mean, this is the 1960s. Right? Probably people didn't behave like that on the tennis court back in the day. But still, it makes no sense to us, the edit. And we have to really look at something like this and question the judgment. So this, this was a, a really interesting story, and it was funny. I, I found these pictures during the um, big issues that were going on in South Carolina where they were debating taking down the Confederate flag from the federal buildings, and so we were so excited when we found this. This is Red, Reverend Kendall Smith, and um, Reverend Smith was rather um, annoyed, let's just say, at um, school segregation that was taking place in New York City, but he was also a little bit annoyed that the Confederate flag uh, was on display in City Hall. And it was because they had flags from all over the country on display at that period. It's unclear to us whether he took that flag down from the walls at City Hall or whether he brought his own flag with him, but I think that's um, you know, not the point of this. He takes the flag, goes down to City Hall, or takes it from City Hall, and then he marches outside to City Hall Park and lights it on fire. And when you look at this picture, well, I don't know, it's maybe a half a dozen people, a dozen people there, and the Times wrote multiple stories on this, this situation. Well, Kendall Smith was arrested for rioting. Not much of a riot. He's a very small riot. He talked in great detail about how there were a few homeless people, um, a couple of cops, um, some mothers and with strollers, passers by, a photographer, a journalist, how <laughs> many men. Well, he gets thrown in the clay and um, charged with riot. But we, we, we wrote this, and we never showed that there's no riot going on here. And what's even more fascinating was just a few short weeks before this event, the massive protests were going on in Central Park over the Vietnam War. And there were many white students burning the American flag in Central Park. And there were no reports of arrests for that. Um, next up we have, uh, this is one of my favorites, um, if, really for what it is. Th this is a photograph taken by our great civil rights reporter, Claude Sitton. And Claude, um, fascinating fellow, covered the South during uh, all of its strife. 
And Claude, from what we found out after the fact, Claude would often take photographs as reporting notes. And you can see some of his notes here. And he, you know, it was a dangerous job. He was in a situation where you could get yourself killed reporting on these kinds of things down there. Claude would often, according to his family that we talked to, hide his camera under his coat and snap away. Um, this particular, if you go back, that's okay. Um, these particular pictures here were a series he went in, um, photographed Megger Evers. Well, Megger was um, assassinated about three weeks after this photo, three, four weeks after this photo was taken. And we do believe that this is the only photograph the Times ever took of him. Um, it wasn't published, it wasn't intended to be published. Claude would use these to report back. Uh, whether or not Medgar knew he was being photographed at that time is unknown. But um, you know, Claude did have many pictures published, but the majority of the collection that I found were used for things just going back and, and trying to figure out what to say after the fact. But he couldn't get those details right. But this was one of those instances where Medgar Records, again, was someone who we were interested in looking for. And to find this um, image of him, um, you know, the only one that we know of, it was really a powerful moment for us. So we're getting a little bit of a sneak preview. <laughs> we move from Edgar to Merlay. So here, here's another interesting um, fact about why we think some of the pictures weren't published. So here's Merle Evers at Becker's funeral. And our photographer, staff photographer, George James, who's based out of Washington, DC, uh, got to the funeral. He was in Arlington, he was at the casket, he was with the family, and George shot dozens and dozens and dozens of rolls of film. Well, the next day in the paper, the New York Times had a very famous and spectacular photograph shot by the Associated Press that showed a long line of the funeral procession, the mass amount of people that, that showed up. But we have to wonder why it wasn't anything from George's film taken. Now, George was based in Washington. We questioned, um, did the film not get back to New York in time? Was he unable to develop it quickly enough and on deadline? Um, the other thing is, George was a magazine photographer, primarily shot for the feature sections in the magazine. Were they planning a feature on this that, that never ran? Um, it's unknown. But we looked back into this and, and saw hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pictures close up of the crowds. Um, uh, Necker was buried at Arlington. Uh, he was a soldier. The soldiers were there. The townspeople were there, black, white. It was one of the most beautiful sets of photographs that I had ever seen. And sadly, never made it to the print. And the famous AP photo lives on. Um, another example of uh, possible reasons. So when I, I met uh, with John Godfrey Morris, John said, you know, I always had a headshot. I had three inches in the paper. And if you look, um, yeah, if we look at a photo like this, you couldn't run a picture like this in a, in a space two inches wide. It's so magnificent. Well, what we ran in the paper the next day, the other thing you might notice here, Dizzy's eyes are kind of closed, his head's sort of cocked down, the kids are making funny faces. This is what makes this picture so spectacular, right? Well, the Times would not have run a picture of somebody with their eyes closed and a kid making a funny face, because then kid, it looks like they're in Catholic school, the kid probably would have gotten smacked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, we, what we ran the next day was a very uh, posed photograph of Dizzy holding that uh, horn. And I think the girl he has the arm around was, was in the photo posing with him very politely. Uh, <laughs> you know, much more acceptable photograph than the New York Times at the time. But you look at it and it's just such a spectacular moment that was left and, and sadly misedited for um, you know, the, well, I hate to say for the words, but yeah, the story was long. Your description. <laughs> all right, all right, let's move on to Baldwin. So Baldwin was obviously someone we were interested in looking for, and I think this was really a wonderful find. This shows you what it means when you have a really great uh, photo editor like Darcy. So Darcy was looking for, for Baldwin, and what she came up with was this wonderful uh, contact sheet um, of, you know, the kind of second by second by second by second um, snaps uh, of the photographer um, in a single sitting uh, with James Baldwin. And, uh, you know, we both said that it's like a little movie reel. You can kind of watch and see his expressions change. Um, and um, Darcy, which was the photo that we ran? Um, I, I 
watched it this time. It's frame 19, which is on the upper left, the second one down. Yeah. So, you know, a nice smiley picture, but you know, nowadays if I have to edit this and I have to read the story and know who James Baldwin is, I'm going on the right hand side, second to the bottom where he's got the cigarettes now yeah. his eyes closed. It's so much more expressive, right? And I would have gotten Mark, you would have let me run that. No problem with that. And what um. was um, it turned out that he had a very complicated relationship with his own face. You know, his father um, you know, grew up being told that he was ugly, and he internalized um, a lot of that. And it's hard to imagine that he's <laughs> such an iconic face, um, but that's what um, the story was about. I think that's an important image to include in the book too, because I wanted to give the readers of the book a sense of what the photo editor saw and what our challenges were, um, and really to give you kind of a sense. I think what this also does is Rachel says is a little mini movie reel. And knowing who this photographer was, this was a fellow by the name of Jack Manning. Jack was the kind of guy who walked into the room, um, went shh, and then left for the day. <laughs> <laughs> so you have about, I don't know, he was there, my guess was 90 seconds. <laughs> uh, challenge for the photo editor, certainly. Uh, but in as an historical artifact, and you really get a good sense of A, what the challenge was, B, what we were faced with, and um, I wanted to really make sure people understood that sometimes the decisions that we make are subjective. You know, I like A, you like B, let's fight about it. And that happens a lot in the newsroom. <laughs> okay. All right, um, our, we have, by the way, I would just like to point out that the person who wrote this story, Jay Scheiber, is sitting in the back of the audience back there. Welcome, Jay. Thank you. <laughs> Yay. Um, so this is uh, another good example of the moment in history, the moment that this book was taken was not the story of the day. This is the raising of Evans Field, and that's Roy Campanella, who after the big ceremony went out there and posed for a photographer. Well, the next day in the paper, the Times ran the news, which was a giant wrecking ball, which they painted as a baseball. And I think the mayor might have been in the picture, I'm not recalling, but the, the dignitaries were certainly there, and they're swinging the wrecking ball, and they're about to take Evans Field down. Well, this man stopped out, stepped out there, um, shed a tear for, for loss of, of baseball history. And the picture that ran the next day was a big, beautiful photo of that wrecking ball, but he wasn't the story. I don't even think, I don't know, if, Jay, if you remember from reading it, but um, I don't even think he actually made the story the next day. His name, I don't believe, that I recall was even mentioned. Only history years later. So this is actually um, another good example of a photo that never would have made the New York Times. It is so spectacular. And this happens to be my personal favorite photo in the book. This is an image from the uh, aftermath of the Detroit riots. About a week or so, maybe less than a week or so after the riots, a great photographer Sam Falk went out there to cover it for the paper. Actually covered it for the magazine, excuse me. And this was a roll of film in the sack of negatives they pulled out, it must have been 50 or 60 rolls of film in that sack. And this one was marked destroyed, so I went right for it. <laughs> and, um, it was marked destroyed because it, it, the whole roll was double exposed. It was a big mistake. And so they wouldn't think this was a mistake. They couldn't possibly run something like this. But the photographer did go back and re-photograph this family. And so she, a mother of five, was left homeless when her apartment building went on fire. We wrote a nice story about it in the magazine. But if you look at the mistake in here, it's superimposed on top of a place called the Bamboo Show Bar. And the Bamboo Show Bar happened to be uh, the place where Detroit's jazz greats in the golden era performed. Thelonious Monk performed there, John Coltrane performed there, Lionel Hampton performed there. I mean, when I started to research this place, the list of names, gosh, it was like Michelle alive at that period. Um, and then you see this car coming in, which you know, Detroit's the Motor City. So you have this image that represents just disaster and destruction and great jazz history, which it would, Detroit's famous for in Motor City. And on top of that, it happens to be a beautiful work of art. And they wanted to throw this out, and they got hidden, and nobody ever saw it. So I'm so glad we had the opportunity to, to, to bring it up. Um, Manette Sleet, um, here 
it's a very good example of somebody that was on Rachel Dana and Damien's wish list. We need Monetta Sleet. And he's the first um, African American man to win a Pulitzer Prize, right? So I went to Monetta's folders and uh, I started to research everything we wrote about Monetta and I went and looked at all the film and I couldn't find anything in the first round unique to Minetta. I found many, many Ebony Handup photos. He worked for Ebony Magazine. I found many Associated Press photos. I found sometimes prints of him, but they were all published, so nothing qualified. And I happened to find this image. Uh, it, it was a mistake, actually, how I found it. I was researching a story about integration on college campuses. And I found this magnificent roll of film. It was a story about how um, college, was well, Wesleyan, Wesleyan, Wesleyan University, yeah. was uh, the most diverse campus on American soil. And it was an interview with the school president. And the president said, this is such a great place. We have such a diverse student body. But my problem is all the black kids hang out with all the black kids, and all the white kids hang out with all the white kids. And it was a great photo, I think, but they published it. And it was a shot of the cafeteria and all the tables, and all the black kids sitting at the table in the middle together, and all the white kids all sitting together. So just as I'm about to toss this whole sack of negatives aside, out falls a handwritten note from the photographer, Eddie Hauser, to John Dugan, a different John, who was photo editor at the time. He says, hey, John, you're never going to believe what I ran into today. I was taking the shoot, and I, I saw Minetta on the campus, and uh, he was touring it with his son. He says, hi, I snapped a picture. And I was like, Minetta? I mean, how many people could be named Minetta, right? <laughs> Not a lot. So I'm looking at the loop, and I, I couldn't see the loop. I had the technicians in the lab scan it, and we, we started looking, comparing photos of him. And I was like, oh, we found Minetta sleep. We did. We were so excited. But I think it talks a little bit about the enormity of this collection and how we find things. The Times is in the process of digitizing much of it. Um, there are people coming in from the outside saying, we'll digitize it for you. But I think it's a great example of unless you've got somebody there doing the research, knowing the names, knowing the information, understanding the history of it, you could pass over something like this. Because if his name was not in the caption documents, his name never appeared in the story. So there would be no way of truly searching for things like this unless you really stuck your, you know, your boots in the mud and, and, and looked for it in a hard hard way. Now this next one, um, Mark is talking a little bit about how we like to wanted to try and engage with readers. And this was this was one where we um, we you know came uh, you know very um, deliberately uh, and wanted to engage with our viewers about this. And we'll give you a little test. So who's in this photo? Yeah. Oh so you know. they know and who else? <laughs> I heard I heard Mahalia Jackson and, and who else? Who's, who's uh, the guy there at the time? That's Mayor Lindsay. All right. Wow. <laughs> That's right. Very good. How are these folks are fun? <laughs> we actually worked with the New York Times Learning Network. This is an organization that reaches out to students, uh, mostly I think middle school and high school students. Is that <coughs> and they thought this would be a really fun test. Can we put this out there with no caption information and ask these students What's happening in this picture? That was the Who problem. are they and what's happening? What's happening? And overwhelmingly, 90-something percent of the students came back and said, here is a rich white politician coming to the black trailer park to help the poor, poor black lady. <laughs> overwhelmingly. And uh, we, you know, that wasn't really all that surprising, right? That's not a surprising answer, except we revealed it to the kids. We said, you know, actually, that's, you're right, that is a rich white politician, but he, he's actually asking this very, probably even richer, more famous <laughs> singer for her help. And the kids responded in such an amazing way. They were actually, they said, you know, we're embarrassed that we still think like that. Um, it was a very honest answer that they gave us. Um, but they, they felt like, wow, you know, you really opened up our, our minds. And the other thing, too, that was interesting about this photo is this was, again, one of these instances where we wondered, and, and Darcy said, as the photo editor, I, I don't understand the decision that was made. So there was an article that ran with the story, and, and the photo was just kind of this huge crowd photo. It was, a, it was it, and it had a big enough space. It had a, uh, maybe a four-column picture, so, you know, a picture that big in the print newspaper. 
but it was way from the back. Like, it, it's imagine someone taking a picture of us up here from the back of the room. And, and it wasn't this moment, but it talked about this moment. That was the other strange thing. That was thing. the other strange thing. Very so we wondered, like, was there something about the sensibilities of, you know, a black woman with her arm on his shoulder? You know, was there something there that, um, you know, ruled it out? It, it just, um, you know, for, for her, when she looked at that, she said, this is so, so much the better photo. It, it, it didn't compare. It didn't compare. So this next one was the one um, that didn't occur to us. It's a, a photo from Princeton, New Jersey, where um, a, a school that was recently integrated, um, and we just put, you know, here's a photo of the classroom recently integrated in Princeton, and people said, oh, but who are the kids, and what happened to them? And so we said, well, who are the kids, and what happened to them? <laughs> and so we asked, um, uh, you know, our, our, our readers, and, um, you know, it was shared, this project was shared all over the place on social media, and um, if you look to the next photo, uh, someone shared it with her, and, and she saw herself um, as a little girl um, in the New York Times. And uh, we were so excited when she, you know, got in touch. We were like, oh, we found her. We still haven't found the boy, so if anyone knows. <laughs> if the boy is here tonight. <laughs> She also told us a really wonderful yeah. story. She, it turns out she became a teacher, and yeah. she talked about that classroom. And so her teacher was an African American woman who really influenced her and shaped her life as a student and into yeah. her adulthood. Yeah. She told a great story. Helps to have a great, great uh, subject. Um, so here's a. Uh, yeah, yep. that's a great one too. So this is interesting. This is actually a photograph of Malcolm X's burnt out house. So about um, a, week. a week or so. So before he was assassinated. They fired him his queen's home. And uh, Don Hogan Charles, again, uh, our great staffer, uh, Don knew uh, the family. He knew them very well. He worked, walked in their circles. He was friends with them, personal friends with them. And he was the only photographer that we know of. I haven't seen other photos like this. Uh, he was the only photographer that got into the house, and he took several rolls of film of the damage. Yeah, it's really quite Well, the next day in the paper, the Times ran, once again, a very famous wire photo of Malcolm <coughs> cleaning the home. And it's it was a picture. Um, but why, we have to ask ourselves, did we not run these images? There were pictures in his kitchen. There were pictures, this is, I believe, the dining room. Um, pictures all over the house, pictures of, of his wife uh, and the security guards, and, and it was so uh, shocking. And nothing, never, not even after he was assassinated. And so we looked at this and we tried to, again, analyze maybe why was this left behind? Why something so exclusive and so fascinating was left? And we noticed this is a very dark, dark photo. Um, I know our lab technicians um, really worked very hard to uh, bring up the tones in that image. And you have to think newsprint at the time was a 65 line screen. And if you ran a dark, dark photo, it would turn to blood. So there could have been some fears that pictures <coughs> might not have reproduced. Uh, it could have been that they felt that, or that they wanted him in the They wanted they had one, one, one photo and you, you want to see the guy himself, and, and maybe they went with that. Yeah, they were, they were pretty literal about things like that. Yeah. So again, our, when we rediscovered this take inside the home, I think there were two or three rolls yes. of film there, we were just blown away. Uh, this is our, yeah. back to Mark's question that he asked. Our last one, <laughs> it's our final one. So I'd like to introduce you to Grady <coughs> Cummings. This uh, is a photograph of Grady in, uh, I think it was 65, he was taken this photograph. Well, Grady um, had sadly, or so we believed, sadly had a short life. Grady drops dead at the age of 36 of a massive heart attack. Um, let me introduce you to what Grady's obituary said. It said that Grady was the second African-American man to, this is a New York Times obituary, by the way, 
um, separate, second African American man to ever run for president of the United States. It said he was publisher of a newspaper based out of Brooklyn. It called him one of the brightest young political minds of the time and likened him to uh, Martin Luther King. He was an up and rising political figure. And this was a tragic, tragic loss for society. Uh, we never ran his picture in the paper with the obituary. We have this in the files. Well, it turns out um, we were going to last February for Black History Month. Mark came to the team here and said, you know, can we run a couple of these stories that you're going to put in the book in the national section? It would be really fun to run one a month. Uh, and we could talk about it. So we chose this, this guy. We thought he was so fascinating. And my co-author, Damien, and I sat down to uh, thicken up the story. Because we had to write for the national section. We had to write a lot longer. Well, Damien comes to me and says, you know, there's not a lot of information here. We have this a bit, we have a couple of stories on the guy. I think we have 11 stories in the paper about him. And he says, but it's kind of weird because I thought you said he died in 1969, but I, I see him quoted in 1972. <laughs> <laughs> I, I blew it off. I was like, because you know, um, he had like nine kids or eight kids or something according to the obituary. And he was Gradio Cummings the third. Maybe they quoted the fourth and just got it wrong. He's like, yeah, okay. Let's, let's see if we can find some more information. So we keep digging, we keep digging. And all of a sudden, I think I find a story in the Washington Post quoted 1974, 76, something like that. I'm like, wow, somebody like got it wrong again. How strange is this? And then Damien comes up with one. He was quoted in the Arizona Republic. And we keep seeing him quoted in these newspapers. All the Grado comes up there, Grado comes up with After After his death. So at one point, Damien and I were going, wow, somebody really like was pretending to be him. This is crazy. So Damien was like, we got to call research. So we, we got our great researcher, Susan Beachy, involved in this. And Susan says, let me pull the birth and death certificates. And well, it turns out he actually died in like 1985. Like, but he has his own bit in the time. Here's the open. <laughs> We're reading like a different guy. Well, we then discover a story in the Amsterdam news, actually. And uh, it reads about how Radio Cummings faked his death mm -hmm. in oh, Ebony Magazine, the New York Times, the Amsterdam News, and several other major news organizations. Grady apparently was being pursued by the Black Panther Party. He was fearing for his life, and so he played dead. And we fell for it. And we wrote about this. We put this in the national section, right? We have this great story, and it's very funny. But after this book closes, and after the national story runs, a letter comes to me, again, from a reader. And this reader happened to be a former New York Times employee, who writes, um, excuse me, let me find my space up here and do this. <laughs> um, he says, I was an eyewitness to the unfolding of the hilarious story about Radio Cummings' premature obituary in the paper. <coughs> Shortly after the obituary ran, but Cummings called the Metro Dust to say he was not in fact dead, that he had faked his obituary because his life was in danger. Arthur Gelb, who, for those of you who don't know, who was the executive editor of the New York Times at the time, <coughs> Arthur Gelb, his arms flailing like a windmill, ran up to Clayton Mills, the legendary senior political writer, who was concentrating on his typewriter. Who the hell is this Gradio Cummings guy, Arthur demanded. Without looking up, Clay said, oh, he's a nut. A gadfly, can't be trusted. But he just called to say that the obituary we ran was fake and that he's alive, Arthur said. Again, concentrating on the story, Clay replied, don't believe a word he says, and he can't be trusted. <laughs> <laughs> so the story that we ran was 48 years after the obituary. The New York Times knew that the obituary was fake, and the New York Times never corrected it. <laughs> you asked me about uh, yeah, the best time. That's what it's about. There it is. That is a good one. That is a good one. We, um, so this was truly amazing, and that, that's what this book is is like. I mean, just amazing tales through through history. Um, do we have time for some questions from the audience? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, 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 let's do that. Your process as to how you determine which photos to put in the book, and my second question is, when is Volume Two coming out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
we really wanted a range. I mean, part of it was, you know, Darcy's finding all these amazing images, and then we've got lots of um, questions, so, you know, we like this person. <coughs> One thing we haven't talked about was we, we talked about um, the images um, that weren't published that we um, have in the book, that some of which you saw here. But one of the things that was really interesting um, that we found was there were people who we felt should have been, we should have had photos of that we didn't. You know, um, most of our photo staff was based in New York, and we did not have Romare Bearden, we did not have W.E. Du Bois, we did not have Richard Wright. And it was really, again, one of those questions about I guess like how we were, how were we covering um, African Americans? But in terms of picking it, I mean, it was hard. I mean, I think what we wanted to raise started with the famous. I think that was right. the easiest thing to do. We started with Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and Thurgood Marshall, all the names that people uh, would know and understand quickly. But what quickly happened was we started to find the ordinary. We found a day in Harlem. We found a parade. We found just a family, um, and, and, and we, I think we soon realized that it was the ordinary that was even more interesting and than the resonance. And volume two, I keep asking. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much in this collection that we could do a volume two, a volume three, a volume four. I just got to get somebody to. If there is a volume two, it will be presented on this stage. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to do it. Good evening. So I had a question about the photographer that captured Harlem and the Medgar Evers um, house burning. So who hired him to take those pictures? He just captured them himself, or? Yeah, he was, he, was, um, he was sent out by the editors at the time. I, you know, I think he was hired in 60, he started working with the Times in 64, I think he was put on staff in 66. I'm, I'm pretty certain that was under John Godfrey Morris's um, uh, rule as photo editor, and I know John really did a lot to diversify the staff at that point. I think John really had a, a huge vision. <coughs> So what the staff should look like, um, both women, um, people of color, uh, Asian Americans were put on staff during his tenure. So, um, yeah. I just had a quick question. The photo of, of uh, Martin Luther King in the round, it looks as though that's Thurgood Marshall and Ralph Bunch. Is that correct? Um, I can't recall. We can go back and take a look. Yeah, that's the, I can recognize the glasses. So Bunch is the guy who showed up. Ralph Bunch is to the, to the right. That is so funny because we didn't even look. I don't even think there was any caption with the uh, No, that's there another names, challenge that right? we have a lot of times. Photos, if the people were not the center, central figure right. in the story, many times the photographers just would fix the information as soon as it's able. That's great. Nice. That's great. We have another shot of third. Yeah, so we actually learned some information. We don't have the <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Thank you very much. One more question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I, I guess my question is, I was, I was listening to NPR the other day, and a historian was talking about her problem with um, Black History Month being that it was too reductionist, and that we visit the same figures over and over, the same, mm -hmm. and that um, that other that the rest of Black history sort of gets swept under the, the carpet, and visiting four famous figures every year isn't, isn't doing service to the history of African Americans. So I was just wondering what you thought this book did to sort of, sort of fill in some of those gaps um, in terms of the stories that aren't, haven't been told, and Maybe figures that um, aren't as iconic, but are, but um, were really important to know about. So people that you want to know. About. Yeah, I mean, I think I think for a lot of us, you know, there was that kind of frustration about Black History Month. It's kind of like, okay, here's your moment, and now it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so uh, I think you know, this was. I mean, uh, this was uh, started as a Black History Month project. Um, and obviously we were looking for, um, at least when we started, looking for, you know, kind of iconic figures and, and, and people who had been um, lost. Um, but, you know, it, it really, um, I think, was both an opportunity to um, describe, as we went through, as Darcy just described, about just beautiful, ordinary scenes of people um, <coughs> in New York and around the country 
um, in their moments in their lives. And also, too, what was different was it was an opportunity for the New York Times to look at itself yeah. and uh, to look at how we covered um, people of color and, and how we did it and how we contributed to erasure of communities sometimes. And um, as an institution, you know, you know, big institutions don't often do that. Um, and, you know, we very, you know, with Mark and, um, you know, with Bing and was the other editor, we really looked hard and were very explicit about it places where we thought there were these gaps and, and why. And um, people really, really appreciated that. Thank you, Thank you so much. This is fantastic. Great. Thank you, everyone.